Um, next presentation will be from a McDonald's over in the US. And she will be discussing dry digestion for myself. Yeah. Thank you, Dana. Um, thank you all for attending. Uh, it's near the end of a long and highly informative uh, conference. I don't know about you, but there's been a lot of um, overlapping presentations, and I haven't had a chance to see all of them that I was interested in, so I'm really looking forward to seeing those presented online. Um, what you're going to see in here today, some of it is stuff you've heard before, or it continues to be the same information as before. And I'm going to present that as a good thing. We've heard a lot about problems with digesters and how they fail and how they have upsets and blah, 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 blah. I'm going to present what I guess in contrast is sort of a, um, could be perceived as boring in that since 2006, we've operated a digester on extremely high solids, comparatively speaking, materials, and it has continued to operate uh, every single day since we started it up and to con continue to improve performance uh, year on year. Um, so what I'll talk about is some of the characteristics of those feedstocks and how they might relate to some of the high solids manures that are out there and some of those high solids crop residuals that farmers could have control over. We've heard a lot about co-digestion of off-farm substrates. Um, sometimes you get caught in that fight for feedstocks. And so this presentation is going to look more at the agricultural-based uh, co-substrates that a farmer might be able to choose and to say, hey, I can control that. I know what my costs will be. I know what the availability will be. I'll present some European research on uh, different operating plants, ours and others, and um, give you an understanding of what our system for dry continuous digestion looks at. And then also importantly look at uh, example economics um, because the systems will not pay out everywhere. Uh, there has to be the right set of factors. So we've heard a lot about the variability in manure, the difference in the moisture content, um, the difference in farm habits, practices, storage, ambient temperature, and how all of that uh, varies from place to place. Um, and also, intuitively, uh, it's very obvious that if you're going to build a digester uh, to handle a certain amount of manure, the less water that you have to have in there means the less reactor capacity that you have to have at a given um, retention time. This particular chart, I said, OK, let's just use nominal book values for you want to produce one megawatt of electricity. So nominal biogas per uh, quantity of each of these types of manure. Uh, what reactor size? How much uh, cubic feet or gallons or cubic meters, whichever unit of measure you prefer using, uh, do you need? So this chart reinforces the, the obvious. You need more. Uh, if you're going to operate uh, at more dilute situations. So in addition to those manures, I talked about some of the different residuals. And uh, I know a lot of you probably also go to the Tulare Farm Show or the Louisville Farm Show, and the number of vendors out there that are developing or selling pieces of equipment to economically harvest the stovers from each of the types of crops is growing year on year. And they're find, trying to find the sweet spot between either concurrent collection with the crop itself or the least cost equation for subsequent collection. So Europe, um, not that we should feel less than, but <laughs> Europe has been at this a long time, and they're pretty darn organized about it. So we have the International uh, Energy Association, and they divide things into tasks. And I, some of you were in the session where I stood up and said, okay, I'm vice chair of the American Biogas Council. Well, one of the things that we're trying to do with the American Biogas Council is to establish a far more productive relationship with academia so that research that's going on is answering the unanswered questions instead of repeating research on things that have already been looked at. So how do we step off from a point of common knowledge and get to 
where we want things to go. It'll be much more fun research for the people doing it <laughs> because it, it will have real tangible value out there. So this particular task looked at um, how to maximize the value from these different crops or crops residuals. So they looked at each of these on a variety of metrics. They looked at methane yield on a volatile solids basis. They then also looked at it methane yield per acre because obviously every crop you know, has a different tonnage per acre yield. So in the first one, you can see that the rank order of what was, what was highest is barley, triticale, beets, alfalfa, rhubarb, rye. Well, but when you look at it on per acre, if you are acreage limited, then that rank ordering changes. Wow, are you going to get a, you know, a corn farmer to switch to potatoes? Do you have the right soil to make those kinds of, of switches? Um, they also looked at it in terms of energy inputs versus energy outputs. But what is very interesting for this chart when it comes to animal digestion is more than half of the energy input to raising these crops or getting those crop residuals off is the fertilizer that is used. So if we are displacing purchased fertilizer with reuse of digestate onto those soils, whether we place them in whole or in part, we can impact this uh, energy ratio uh, substantially. So, all right, you've grown these, you've harvested them. How do they compare? Well, the first study compared 41 Austrian digestion plants that were processing a combination of manure and these energy crops. And what they found is um, a tremendous variability. You, I hope you can read the second line here, hydraulic retention time. Um, the median was 139 days. I wonder why that is. Now, anomalies in data you need to look out for. In Europe, there were incentives per cubic meter of built capacity. So how many cubic meters are you going to build? <laughs> You're going to build as much as you want, right? And hey, if I got all the capacity in the world, I am going to run that retention time as long as I can keep those bugs healthy enough because as you have less and less food available, your bugs don't stay so happy. But this data can often be misinterpreted to say you either need or you want to have excessively long retention times. This is how you should design your systems. Well, no, it's similar to the data in terms of genset utilization. A lot of people install far more genset than they really need, so then it can make a system look like it's not performing, and maybe it's performing pretty well for what's being fed to it, you know, at the time. So, um, as uh, these charts again are all in the um, in the presentations, and then also if anyone stopped by my booth, there's an article that contains a lot of this data. And the original studies are all available if you go to the IEA website. So what. AWS did was to compare our Dranko farm system to the data for these 41 plants. And what we have been showing consistently since 2006 is a retention time of right around 20 days. And again, for those of you I've talked to already about our system, we don't really look at retention time per se. Retention time is an extrapolated result of how we operate a system to maximize your revenue per cubic meter of digester and you maximize your revenue per ton of substrate fed. And whatever retention time that ends up falling out to, you know, we don't care, quite frankly, if it's 20 or 25 days or whatever. It's all about the money. Um, the significant part, however, is in terms of the loading rates that we are able to achieve with this type of a system. And being able to load at those significantly high rates is all about keeping the functionality of the digester as happy as possible. A second study was also done under Task 37, and this one was done on um, 60, I believe it was 61 or 65 digesters. And in this study, the Drinko farm plant was also included back in 2009. 
At that point in time, we were operating the facility at 500 kW because that was the limit of what the energy authority in Germany would allow that facility. We could produce more gas, but they said, no, you can only put 500 onto the grid at that farm. Since then, they raised that and we're now putting uh, a full meg onto the grid at that farm. So we did that, not by increasing the digester uh, size, we increased it by bringing the loading rate from 9.7 up to that 16 to 17 uh, kilograms of volatile solids per cubic meter per day. Um, and this then just summarizes each of those uh, charts and um, the uh, different parameters upon which. This particular facility is operated at thermophilic conditions. The mixture of feedstocks, fresh feedstocks going into the digesters um, averages about um, somewhere between 35 and 45 percent total solids. Um, because of, of the very high digestibility of the material, as it's sinking by gravity down the tank, it's being digested, and the consistency in the tank uh, takes on sort of the characteristics of chocolate mousse, or toothpaste, if you will, but the gas is being generated and percolating up. So that's why it has, you know, that mousse, you know, sort of consistency. Um, and obviously because of that high digestibility, you're also operating inside the tank at an average total solid that reflects the fact you've volatilized, you've destroyed a lot of those solids. So inside the digester, you're going to be somewhere between 18 and 22 percent total solids with this particular mix of feedstocks. Um, just a schematic of it, um, what's different and proprietary about this particular design is that right here at the knuckle of the tank, we are extracting partially digested material that has had anywhere from two to four days in the digester on its first trip, but a portion of the material will have gone several trips. And that partially digested material then gets intimately mixed with fresh feedstock for immediate inoculation and very close contact of the microorganisms with that fresh feedstock. And then that mixture is what's pumped to the top of the digester. There are no moving parts inside the digester, nothing. Um, you never have to open the digester. Uh, this one has not been opened since 2006, since when it started. Um, we have a similar design that operates on garbage and our longest operating plant has been 22 years in operation with one day of opening when the ownership of the facility was changed. They bought it from us because it was performing well enough after 12 years. So anyway, it's designed to operate without any uh, uh, interruption. Yeah. Um, this, the design of this pump um, does depend on the substrate mixture. And OWS is probably, I've been with them since 2009, they're an extremely conservative company. And we will not sell a system with an underdesigned pump. For our garbage systems, we in fact co invented, co developed a pump with Putzmeister, which, if you can imagine pumping concrete 200 feet, and we said, okay, we want to be able to pump 40% solids if we need to 300 feet. So that's how we approach these systems. Now, depending on the morphology, depending on all the characteristics of what's going into this digester, we have different grades of pumps depending on those feed side mixtures. Um, I, I strongly believe that material handling is the stepchild. I mean, it just never gets the respect that it should in these systems, and that's where most of them fail, in my mind. Um, this is just the, the data uh, on a variety of parameters. We're currently running this system at about 75% destruction of total solids. Um, 
right around 85, 90% destruction of volatile solids. We think that that's the sweet spot for this digester. Uh, we could lengthen, you know, increase the number of recirculation loops and probably edge that higher, but the cost-benefit ratio doesn't um, merit it in this case. Now, I want to say one word about methane content. A lot of folks try to compare and contrast digester designs on methane content. Well, methane content can be impacted by things that have to do with digester design or operation, but fundamentally, you know, it is determined by the substrate and, you know, the inherent biochemistry. So can you do other things that are, you know, non-standard in order to tweak this or to slightly off-gas some of the CO2, you know, early such that biogas should be measuring at the end has an apparent higher methane content, yes. But be extremely careful about compare and contrast uh, system to system based on methane content. Just be sure you know what assumptions and what they're trying to show. Um, this particular system has a footprint of a little less than an acre, including the storage for all of the commodities. And this is an extremely simple commodity storage type of a system. Um, very low cost, um, and it has worked very effectively uh, since startup. Maize silage is the primary feedstock. OWS owns 52% of this facility. Four farmers own the other 48%. Three of them grow the maize, and one of them is uh, the crop harvester. Um, all right. So, can it work here? You know, what are the economics? I'll present two different examples, and uh, I'll use one example that speaks to what you may have heard in one of the other animal digestion um, presentations, which is, hey, farmers don't want to do this. They just want to farm. They just want to milk cows, you know, raise beef, you know, whatever. So, okay, we need third-party operators. So, here's a potential model for a third-party operator. They're going to get paid to take poultry manure that somebody has a problem and expects getting rid of, they're in a watershed area, so they're going to get paid $10 a ton to take it off that farm's hands. Is that a realistic assumption? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Depends on how hard up you are in a given area. Depends on its value for fertilizer where you are. So if that isn't a reasonable assumption, you can replace poultry manure with another uh, manure that you think has a, a better prospect for it. But um, they get paid for taking that substrate, but then they contract with the farmer to supply an energy crop, and in this one I just took an average value, and whether it's an actual crop or whether it's a stover, um, and they pay that farmer $45 uh, per ton delivered cost. So it just shows you in terms of on our type of system what would be typical O&M and labor, um, and on O&M, for instance, we put maintenance into every operating budget, and what we find in a lot of systems is the maintenance dollars don't get spent on maintenance, they get spent somewhere else. And then they wonder why five years later, you know, we have an issue. Um, we have not had that issue on Dranko Farm because we own it. Um, so on energy value, I have looked at this in terms of 10 cents per kilowatt hour instead of 28 cents per kilowatt hour in Germany. A little different economic proposition. And I've looked at it where, okay, if this is a third party operator, they're then going to sell that digestate coming out of the digester for some moderate nutrient value that then gets reapplied to the farmer's land. So, Again, is that a reasonable supposition? Well, it's one of the business models that's being touted, and it has a debt service coverage ratio of about 4.6. Not bad. Um, are any of those assumptions true for a specific site? Well, that's what you have to do site by site. So what's a different model? You know, what, what if you've got a farmer who says, hey, I'm interested in doing this. I want to expand uh, the number and type of operations I've got going on. Um, I'm going to look at using my own bedded pack manure. 
So I've got about, oh, you know, anywhere between four and 5,000, you know, feeders, maybe feeders and finishers. And I think I can afford to go ahead and collect that soybean stubble or some of that huskage, you know, maybe the top half of the corn stock. And so I'm going to charge the entity nothing for my better pack manure. But yeah, I've got a real cost of harvesting, uh, grinding, and storing that energy crop that this proposition needs to pay for. But once again, I'm going to use the assumption that it's either energy sold or energy replaced at this 10 cents per kilowatt hour. But I'm not going to give the entity a value for digestate because, hey, I didn't charge it for manure in the first place. So the debt service coverage ratio decreases the amount of energy potential decreases too because you've replaced the vast preponderance with manure. So is that a, a viable proposition? It can be in certain areas. Um, just to transition and conclude, we currently have, as you've seen on the maps, about 195 systems operating on uh, farms and for the most part, well, I think on farm, it's true to say that all of these are currently wet digestion and that they're dairy farms, uh, majority-wise. We believe that the drink of farm approach provides uh, a substantial opportunity. How many of these 20,000 additional farms can make it hunt? Well, remember I used 10 cents a kilowatt hour. Most of these farms don't have the on-farm energy load, so you can't offset retail. And how many utilities are you going to get to pay you 10 cents? Not enough. The potential, and now I'm speaking with my ABC hat on, American Biogas Council hat on, is to push for free markets. We've got to push for the ability to take advantage of laws that are already on the books, that allow you to sell energy to willing third-party buyers as long as you're willing to pay the appropriate willing fee. So if you'd like to learn more about that, if you'd like to lend your voice, um, we would love to have you on board to do that. Um, this year, OWS is celebrating its 25th anniversary of continuous operation under the same ownership. There aren't a lot of companies in this industry that can say that. Um, again, it might seem a little bit boring, um, but we, we're still there. Uh, the comment was made in an earlier presentation about you go to these farms and, oh, where are the technology providers? Well, we're still there, and we provide support for um, more than 50 locations that we never built because those designers aren't there anymore, and they need folks to support those operations. And I encourage all of you to consider joining the American Biogas Council if you aren't already a member.